just a couple of things. So the store portion is Ahrimot after the death, after the death of Aharon's sons, Nadav and Ahrimot. <coughs> and it's something that, that needs to be talked about, you know, is that they were priests. God had made them priests. They were anointed as priests. And yet when they brought incense before God, he killed them. Then we know why. So we understand what happened. Why were they killed? Weren't they doing what God wanted them to do? Yeah, what they did is they took fire from another place other than the altar, which is why they call it strange fire, offered strange fire before God. Okay? God is a God of order. Rav Shaul even points out that God it says God is a God of order. He has an order to the way he wants to be worshipped. And what happened is that they violated that Maybe they didn't understand. Maybe they didn't know. But a lot of times we think that we can worship God in any way that we want. Right? And we might think it's good to... I'm going to do this for God, but maybe God... ...what I want you to do. Right? And so in a sense, not that we're going to be struck down... But we offer strange fire before him, and he's not glorified in that. Um, and so we have to, we have to, you know, think about that. We have to, you know, pray about doing something like that. Just like David, he wanted to build God this great house because he realized that he was living in this great palace. But God had just a tent, and he thought, "I'm going to build God this great, this great temple, this great house that he can live in." But you know what God told him? He said, no, you won't build it. But David's heart was right. He wanted to build this for God. And God said, no. Why? Because David had blood on his hands. Not just the blood of wars and stuff, but also because of his transgression of adultery and murder with, the, um, with Bathsheba, right? Solomon's mother. His lust got the better part of him. He was home while his army was fighting. He should have been there with them. And he seen her, took her, even though she was married. Got her pregnant. Brought her husband home to try and get him to sleep with her so they would hide this thing, right? And he refused because he didn't feel it was right that he should be back here enjoying himself while his men were up on the front line dying, right? And so he didn't do it. So David told the general, said, push them forward, and then push pull everybody back except for him so he gets killed. Murder, right? And uh, he didn't really think anything of it at the time until Nathan the prophet came, right? Nathan the prophet came to him and he says, he says, you need to hear this. There's a poor man and a rich man living next to each other. And the poor man, he has this this lamb, this 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 sheep, and it's his pet, and he loves it and treats it very good every day. Just he loves this this sheep, but kind sheep and goats and cattle. His friends come, and he wants to have a special meal for him. But instead of taking his own, he goes and takes the poor man's sheep, the sheep that that is his heart, that his belongs to him that he loves and has taken care of and he kills it and eats it and what does David say man should die and Nathan said that man is you that man is you you did what you did you took the poor man's sheep and killed it for your own pleasure but Nathan tells him he says you, you won't die because of this but the baby that has been produced through this will die in your place. And David, realizing what he had done, began to repent and put on sackcloth and ashes and 
prayed that God would turn away, turn away from having to kill the baby. But here's the other thing. By the law of Moses, uh, David could have been stoned to death. But you know the punishment that that God punished him for wasn't the adultery, wasn't the murder, but it was taking God's name in vain. It was ruining his reputation, God says, because you have made my name stink amongst my enemies. The child will die. When we cause God's name to stink amongst his enemies, when we say, I mean, we're not always perfect, things happen, but when we say things, do things, you know, tell other people, but then we go and do the same thing, we're hypocrites. Yeshua came out against many people there, including uh, the Pharisees for being hypocrites, saying one thing and doing the opposite, right? That's what a hypocrite is. Telling other people, you need to do this, but not doing it. It's like an old saying, do as I say, not as I do, which is <laughs> a dumb saying, you know, because you're just teaching them to be hypocrites. I remember my friend's dad would tell him that. Um, and he'd say, what well, you're doing? He says, yeah, don't do as I do, do as I say, not as I do. <laughs> you know, But, <laughs> you know, your parent is who you watch, who you learn from, right? And so we learn to be hypocrites with sayings like that, right? But God is saying, your reputation is, most, is very important. Even King Solomon in the book of Proverbs even talks about having a great reputation. A uh, good reputation goes before you. But you know the hardest thing is when you have a bad reputation? It's hard to get a good reputation back. It's hard for people to trust you if you've had a bad reputation. It goes out before you too. People will know you. Oh yeah, I remember you. Oh, I heard about you. Yeah, you know. Um, but if they hear a good thing, they're like, oh yeah, 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 join us or whatever. You know, stuff like that, right? It's good to have a good reputation. Be honorable, ethical, peaceful, right? Love our neighbors, even with even if we disagree with them. And that's one of the things, too, is that, that we need to understand, too, in this day and age, it seems like if somebody disagrees with you or you disagree with somebody else, we vilify them. We don't want anything to do with them. We attack them. But that's not how it should be. It's not the way it was for a long time. I've got people that I vehemently disagree with on stuff. But you know what? And they disagree with me. But we're great friends. We go get together and have coffee or a meal, or schmooze together. Um, and we might talk about this stuff, but in the end, we go away as friends. And if, I don't know if you've been to an actual Jewish Bible study, but in a Jewish Bible study, there's a lot of yelling and screaming at each other and even calling them names. But at the end of the study, we're all good friends. We all go our way and come back the next week to do it all over again. <laughs> you know but that's how it's how it should be that's how we grow not ought to change your thoughts on stuff but to prove our point is correct <laughs> right so um, and it's like the old saying goes that when you have two Jews in a room you have three opinions you know and it's because if we agree well then all of a sudden one of us is going to disagree just to bring that upon that goes a uh, a story in the Talmud, uh, it was this rabbi and his students and his study partner, and they would argue over different points and stuff. Well, eventually his, his study partner died, and he was sad. And his disciples, his Talmud didn't, want, didn't know what to do, so they thought, well, maybe if we get him a new study partner, things will go good. He'll be happy again. And so they find another study partner for him, and the weeks go by, and they see him walking down the street, and he's sad again. And they're like, well, I don't know what's going on. So, um, so they ask him, said, Rabbi, Rabbi, what, what's wrong? Didn't, did not uh, uh, the study partner we got for you work out for you? Is it not a good study partner? He says, yes, yes, it's all great. But he agrees with me on everything. <laughs> so 
sometimes the way we grow is to have that difference, you know? Because sometimes we believe things because other people have said it, but when we de dig deeper, we find out that, oh, maybe we're wrong. And it's good to understand, be willing to change. In Judaism, um, we teach that you need to question everything. Don't just take somebody's word for it. Question it. Is it true? Am I just following something because I heard somebody say it and it feels good to me, but maybe it's wrong. Maybe it's not right. Right? How many knows the know the the saying, God helps those who help themselves? That's not in the Bible. <laughs> God helps those who help others. That's in the scriptures. That's in the Bible. And we need to, to look at these things and understand that just because we disagree with somebody doesn't mean we need to vilify them or make them our enemies or push them away. Sometimes it means that God is sending us somebody that can help strengthen our faith. Maybe they need strengthening and seeing what they're seeing. But maybe we do, too, on the other hand, right? So we shouldn't just push them away because we disagree with them. Because then you won't have any friends. We disagree with even our friends on something, right? Yeah. So what we have here is that Nadav and Abihu thought they were going to worship God. And please him. But they did it out of the order. They did it from their own understanding. From their own desire of thinking that they were going to please God. Right? And because they brought uh, foreign flame, foreign fire, uh, strange fire, and burned incense before God, God didn't call for that. If they had brought fire from the altar... It would have been different because that's what God called for. But because they didn't, then God had to purify that area um, because they made it impure by bringing that strange fire before God. And they had to be taken out to a place outside the camp, the place where uh, the burnt offerings and so forth that that need to go outside the camp to be burnt up and stuff would go and god said i will draw close those who i will draw close <clears throat> meaning that if you're not going to do as i have said then this is the same thing that's going to happen they're going to be cut off we see this in many places where god's talking about cutting off for different things we're not at this time, with the tabernacle in the desert, in the, in the wilderness, God says, don't kill your own animals. Bring them to the temple and give thanks to God. He's teaching them something. Because this changed. Once we went into the land, God... Uh, okay? But while they were there, they've got God close at hand. Bring your... And bring them as a peace offering to God. And then go eat, offering your, your sacrifices to the goat demons, to the demons. To the, anytime we, we do these things, when we don't offer them in the place that God has said, we don't do any offerings right now because there's no temple right now, right? So we can't do any af, uh, offerings or sacrifices in that sense. And I hear people talking about, uh, people uh, have talked about, Christians in particular, who have said that that uh, that they have done this thing because they felt God wanted them to do it. But it's wrong. We're not supposed to. Well, God said to bring these things to the place where his name dwells. Even though the temple's not there, his name still dwells in that spot and will have the temple rebuilt when Messiah comes. Okay? So don't just think we can do anything we want to when worshiping God. And, you know, music is great. 
I love music, but sometimes it turns into entertainment instead of worship. Sometimes music helps lift our soul and bring us into the into the realm of worship, right? It gets us going, it lifts us up, but it also brings us down. Um, and we have to watch out for that type of stuff too, um, as long as we do it in, in the right order. Because the Levitical choir used to sing psalms and songs for God at the time of worship. So there's nothing wrong with music. We just need to make sure that, that we're also worshiping God with his word. Um, the, which he even talks about that that uh, that the Torah, studying the Torah, reading the Torah is worth more. That's that's real worship to him. Singing songs, stuff like that, that's great. There's nothing wrong with that. But he desires us to hear his word. And not just listen to it, but to do it. As, as James says, as Yaakov, the brother of Yeshua said too, is that, we need need to be hearers, not just hearers, but doers of God's word, right? So when we hear it, we do it. Just like Israel at Mount Sinai told God, we will hear, we will obey, and we will hear. Okay? We will hear, or we obey, and we will hear. I know it kind of sounds backwards, but we will do, and we will hear. Yes, we will do, and we will hear. And... Uh, so what are we going to do? Well, first off, we got to hear it to know what we got to do, right? But we first need to be willing to do, right? When we're not willing to do and we're just listening, then it becomes blah, 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 right? It's just words. It doesn't mean anything to us. And we go away like we're starving because we didn't get fed because our hearts aren't willing to do, right? And it's not legalism to keep God's Torah. That's the legalistic works that they talk about is doing things only to do them, not for the purpose of worshiping God or following God or bringing, bringing God's word to other people. It's just to show ourselves to other people, make, lift our own selves up. Like Yeshua said, you know, uh, the rabbis sit in the seat of Moses, so do as they say. But don't do as as they do. Now, some of them did this. That that helped the Sadducees uh, bring Yeshua to trial. They wanted to be seen by the people. They wanted people to praise them. They wanted the best seats. They wanted the best food. They wanted people to see them when they were in uh, fasting times and in mourning and to make people feel sorry for them and to greet them in the marketplace as as rabbi or teacher or promote them, right? And we know that that God wants us to be humble. Yeshua even said, do your you know, when you fast, do it in private. When you're uh, when you're praying, go to your closet and pray. God will hear you. Right? Don't make a spectacle. Don't be out on the corner with your Bible yelling at people, hey, you're going to hell. You need to accept Jesus. All these different God never called anybody to do that. All that's doing is stealing glory away from Him and bringing it to yourself, making yourself a spectacle. How does God want us to be a witness to others? By living humbly and walking in His ways to the best of our ability. And doing things the way he wants them done, not the way we want them done. That's part of being one with God, right? When Yeshua says, when Yeshua is asked, well, what, you know, what, what does God look like? Yeshua says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Does God look like Yeshua? No. But Yeshua was doing his will. He was walking in his ways. He was doing that which God sent him to do. And so... Looking at Yeshua, we see God in him because he represents God. Now, we sit, we're singing a song today about the bride, right? And here's the interesting thing. We've got a new moon coming, the new month, right? And the sun reflects the moon, right? Which is the greater light? The sun, right? 
and reflects its glory on the moon for us to see, right? The moon, in essence, represents us. Every month it's born again. This is where we get the concept of uh, the Jewish concept of being born again, is that every month the moon is born again. It's a picture for us to see. God shines his light on us. He wants us to reflect it. And every month, or when we are born again, then that light, because remember, the, when the moon is born again, it just starts out as a little sliver. Not much there. And it teaches us that, that we need to grow every day so that our light can reflect God's light, eventually becoming full, right? But we can't be full on our own, right? That's where Yeshua comes in. And so that light of God is reflecting on the sun, who then also we, and when we are doing God's will, also reflect that light to other people. They see it. Oh, look, the full moon. Oh, look, a man of God or a woman of God, one who really knows God and worships God and walks in his ways to the best of their ability. You know, we do make mistakes. Like we were talking the other day down in Indianapolis uh, with a um, gentleman who's Jewish and uh, talking about... Um, thought but it had to do with it anyway it had to do with the um how we are perceived by other people that that we do make mistakes but we can come to this oh that's proverbs that's right We're, we went to proverbs where it says uh, a righteous man sins seven times a day well what makes this righteous man different than anybody else because he exactly because he's, he stands up, gets up off the ground, dusts himself off, does teshuva, turns himself around, walks back towards God again, right? Sin causes us to get off the path. So we need to get back on the path. And that's what a righteous person will do, is that they will recognize their folly, their sin, ask, confess it to God. That's why uh, Yaakov James talked about the confession of sins, right? Because then... It's like a, a person with uh, addictions and stuff. They can't get help until they recognize that they have a problem. We can't get help with our sin until we recognize that we are sinners. And once we do that, well, now we can make that move. And God has a plan for us if we follow it. Right? And we too can become righteous. But you know what? God also tells us not to think of ourselves as being righteous. Right? The rabbis teach that we should not think of ourselves as being righteous, that we have attained. Even Rav Shaul talks about that too, uh, Rabbi Paul. Um, because then false pride comes before us and we end up thinking we're better than everybody else. So we need to think of ourselves as still yet not attaining that and continue walking in that direction. And when we fall, Get up, confess our sins, repent, and keep walking towards God. And we do the best we can. We're going to make mistakes. God knows that. God knows we're not perfect. That's why he set all this stuff up. That's why he said, when Yeshua says, uh, or when Yeshua is asked, well, how many times do I forgive my brother? Seven times? He says, seven times, 77 times, you know, 490 times. Whatever the number. The thing is, is, Anytime. We forgive your brother all the time. And that's what God does. And that's what he's trying to tell us. Even the rabbis teach that even though we may fall, when we repent and turn back to God, he will forgive us. No matter how many times we sin, we just got to put our pride down and stand up, confess our sins to God, repent of it, and keep walking with God. And that might mean we might have to do it a thousand times because we're, we just haven't been able to overcome this thing. But eventually... We will overcome it. But God is willing to forgive us every time we do, if we repent, if we confess our sins and repent and turn back to him. He loves us. But we also see the severity of God in this with Nadav and Avihu. 
you know. Um, we think of God as this loving God and so forth, and he is, but when we step out of line, uh, impurity into, into his presence, all these different things, he can be a severe God. And we need to respect that. It's like we know that if you touch a wire that has electricity power in it, right? We're going to get a shot, right? So we respect that. We don't want to touch it. We make sure that it's in its protective cover and we don't have it. But it's good for it's good for uses of many different things. But we need to respect that, hey, if we do something wrong here, don't put it in right, uh, good joke, right? And so we respect it in that re in that sense. And so we need to learn to respect, or in essence, what the word is, fear God. <laughs> when we were the dummies that that touched it, knowing we shouldn't have, or, or a flame, right? Different things, right? But the thing is, is that we need to know that there is a limit to us where we can go. And I know, you know, the church talks about that, uh, that, Yeshua, now that now Christians go into the Holy of Holies and all these different things, and we need to realize that, no, we can't go into the Holy of Holies. It's not here on earth. And even in the Heavenly One, Yeshua goes in there for us. We're, huh? He would have died, but he came down with all his glory too, right? Yeah. yeah. And, then, um, and then, of course, with, uh, with the law of Isaiah, or the Samson story from Isaiah, mm -hmm. they were with a limit. Yeah. So that, yep. Yeah. Because we can't see God, not in this form, at least not in this world. In the world to come, it says we will see him. But the thing is, is that we won't have the impurities, the sins and stuff like that, right? But we're going to be changed. In this world, our DNA has sin built into it. That's why it's so simple to sin. And it's so hard to do what's good. That's why there's so much sin around around the world that we see. And the good that we see is very is, is small amounts. And when we see that, a lot of times we go, hey, look, you know, like we see videos on Facebook of, hey, somebody got into an action. We got all these uh, good men over here rescuing the person, you know, they're not fire people or police. They're just average Joe because the person needs to be rescued. It's, it needs to be done. Somebody needs to do it. And so we pray and we think about those things, but how much more do we see of the evil things that go on, right? But in the world to come, God's going to change our DNA. No longer will there be sin in there. It will be righteousness. And it says, because he says in Jeremiah 33, in the world to come, that's after the, the thousand-year reign, when we go into that, into the world to come, we will be changed. He will write his Torah in our hearts and on our minds. And no one will need to be taught about God because everybody will know him. And Yeshua taught us in chapter 17 of John that his prayer for us is to become one with God just as he is one with God. Does that mean we become conglomerated into one big soul or something? No. It means that our will is now his will, or his will is now our will. His purpose for us is now our purpose, and we walk in that. No longer does sin have a place amongst us because it can't dwell with us in the world to come. That's when the new covenant will come into its fullness. Right now we have a taste of it. We'll have a taste of it during the thousand-year reign, the Messianic era. But then will come the eighth day, the world to come, and it'll be... It will fully be upon us. But you have to accept it today. Exactly. You have to accept it today. Because once the world to come comes, and you haven't, sorry to say, but you'll be least in the kingdom. It means you'll be outside. You will have no part of it. You'll have no part of it. So, as God talks about, 
as the apostles even said, today, today is the day to seek salvation because it may not be here tomorrow. Don't think that I've got time, I'm still going to live in the world, but before I die, I'll repent and turn to God. As the rabbis teach also, that day never comes. Today is the day. Repent, turn to God, accept his gift that he has given us through Yeshua the Messiah. And join Israel. Join God's kingdom here on earth, which is Israel, which is come, which the Messiah is going to be king over Israel. When they talk about, just real quick, when they talk about uh, this uh, rapture thing, oh, the church is going to be raptured and stuff like that. Well, when we take a look at all the prophecies about this so-called rapture, we'll realize that it's Israel. God is going to gather his people from all the other nations and bring them back to the land, not to heaven, but back to the land. When Messiah comes, and that's not just his people, but those nations, those people, the nations that take hold of the promises of Messiah, the promises of God, who have accepted Yeshua as the Savior, as the Messiah, and are living to the best of their ability and following God's commandments as the best they understand them. Those are the people God is going to take from the earth because it says in Ezekiel too that, that in that day, you are no longer to consider the foreigners as foreigners, but as born in the land, members of Israel, and to be given an inheritance amongst the tribes in which they dwell. And we see this as a repeat of when Israel left Egypt, right? When, when Israel left Egypt, they left with a mixed company, Nubians, Libyans, Egyptians, and other people from the nations who seen Moses, listened to his message, and believed in the promises that he gave of God and followed the commandments who put the blood of the lamb on their doorposts and they survived. They left with Israel and became part of Israel. It never again separates them. They become part of the tribes. Why? Because they believed in the promises of Moses that came from God. That's our promise for Jew and Gentile. That we all will be one, not to become Jewish. I'm Jewish. God has called you because He's in the process of making one new man of both Jews and Gentiles, one nation. But we have to choose today, not tomorrow. It might be too late. All right, if you want to bow your heads, we'll do the priestly blessing. Our God and God of our fathers, bless us with the threefold blessing in the Torah written by the hand of Moses, your servant, and pronounced by Aharon and his sons, the priests, your holy people, as it is said. May the Lord bless you and protect you, if you will. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May it be your will. May the Lord turn his face toward you and grant you peace. May it be your will. Have a blessed rest of the Sabbath and an awesome Shavuot Tov, a great week this week. Um, Tuesday night, we have our Torah Club at 7. Uh, um, we should be on uh, Book 30, uh, Lesson 30 this week, this next week. Wednesday night at 7, we have our Wednesday night study, continuing on, on Chapter 7 of God's Appointed Customs. And um, so you can join us for that. If you have any questions, you can email us. You can call us. The phone number's there. If I don't answer, just leave a message. If you don't leave a message, I won't call you back. It's just the way it goes. I tell that with everybody.
Sometimes I don't answer it because I'm busy, but if you leave a message, I will call back. Um, ex except unless you're a, uh, one of these telemarketers or something like that. I might call you back. Um, on uh, May 27th, 26th, I can't remember. Um, we'll have guests. Governor Rika Costello from Chicago. She's uh, 26th. Um, and after Shabbat on the 25th, that night we're going to have our Lagba Omer uh, big fire. Uh, not a bone fire, but a big fire. And we'll roast hot dogs and different things like that. Have a good time. And remember God's blessings on that 40th day. Of the Lagwa Omer, the counting of the Omer is what we refer to as the day Yeshua ascended. And then uh, June 12th and 13th is Shavuot, which will begin on uh, the evening of the 11th. And we'll have services on uh, uh, the 12th and 13th morning, 10 a.m. Um, we'll usher in the Shavuot on that night, the 11th, as we normally would, and then have services on uh, the 12th and 13th at 10 a.m. Um, yeah, hopefully you're able to make it. I know sometimes it's hard when it's a work week and you get time off and stuff like that, but you know, do the best you can or at least read those portions during that time. I know, like I said, it's hard to get off work sometimes. Um, <coughs> and uh, and then we're going to have summer. So, um, yeah, life's funny. Yeah. Oh, bummer, I forgot no school. Oh. <laughs> but anyway, so, um, Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat 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 Shalom, Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat 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 Shalom, Shabbat 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 Shalom, Shabbat 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 Shalom, Shabbat 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 Shalom. Shabbat, 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 Shalom. Good Shabbos. Have a good week.